But when I moved into like the industry, it became really obvious that this is like a huge part of the job as well. Not only being mm. a good coder, but also being a good communicator, being a good connector, being a good counterpart to product and design and all the other functions you're finding in the, in the modern day uh, company. If I have like the people in my team who are smarter and better in these things than I am, this is a good thing, right? It's not the ambition for a leader to be the best technical person. If it would be like this, you would have made a mistake because you need to hire people who actually do the job and be the, the, the technical lead or the, the principal engineer or however you call it in your company to cover this role for you and be a sparring partner. This week, Volker Pilz joins me on the podcast. Now, many, many software engineers listen to this podcast, I know. So getting Volker on was something I really wanted to do because when it comes to software engineering and engineering leadership, he's basically done it all. So he started out as an engineer and has been CTO at some smaller companies before being a director of engineering and team lead at the likes of Zalando and now N26. So I wanted to get him on just to find out why and how he made those jumps and that progression into leadership. Because I know there's so many engineers out there that are very, very good technically, and I'm not quite sure how to make that next jump and even if it's the right step for them. We also get into the nitty gritty of the tech world at the moment and what it takes to be a great engineering leader. So without further ado, I'm Alex Bloisey, and this is the Building Our World podcast. We are now live. This is my last episode I'm recording before the Christmas break, but this one is going to come out in January. So Volker, thank you so much for coming on. Um, I wanted to rewind it right back to the beginning, because I know for anyone who's looked at your profile, Director of Engineering now at N26, previously a big stint in the leadership position at Zalando. But let's go right back to the beginning. Why and how did you make that jump into software engineering in the first place? Yeah, Alex, thank you so much for having me in this episode. So super glad to be here just a few days before Christmas. So to your first question, it's a good one, actually. How did I come to software engineering? So basically, I mean, I'm a child of the 80s, right? So I started like right off when the, the area of personal computing has started. Uh, having an uh, Amiga 500 at home. And then my father like bought the first like PC with like Intel processor and stuff. And then I came into the world of, let's say, uh, Windows and, and like also having the possibility of interacting with the computer in a more meaningful way. And this was always super fascinating for me, like going into the details, uh, uh, building up an, an own PC, then a few a few years later, right? And then also in the school time, I really enjoyed a lot, like the, the interaction with computers and programming, getting the first stuff up and running. So this was always a bit of my passion that I developed. So this was for me pretty early uh, in my career or in my, in my life, uh, uh, clear that I want to make a career out of that. And also then... Uh, I decided to to study digital media, which is basically a combination out of like traditional computer science, but also combined with like uh, audio, video, the web, basically, right? So it was basically at this time the beginning of the the, the rise of the internet. It was also mm -hmm. coincidentally also the the dot com bubble at the 2000s that was happening there, right? So uh, this was always a, a part that fascinated me. So I was more at the beginning more into traditional software development in terms of like Java standalone software. But then I realized that the web is something that I want to work on. And this is also like the decision I made to move to Berlin and then got my first job basically in the in the whole startup scene, internet industry. And then I, I basically got hooked with it and I, I stayed uh, ever since basically. Hmm. When did you move to Berlin? I moved to Berlin like in uh, 16 years ago, like in, in 2006, I moved to Berlin. Uh, and then uh, joined basically back then the the, the biggest uh, social media uh, social networking company before the Facebook area began, uh, StudiVZ. Uh, so mm. this was basically my first uh, uh, interaction and, and touch point with like the new internet scene. Okay. Berlin must have changed so much in the time you've been there. Yeah, to totally. I mean, ba back then Berlin wasn't wasn't like the the digital playground that we we see right now. So it was in the early days. It was still like really difficult to get like a proper funding, and uh, the companies that were there, you could really uh, count them on on one or two hands, right? So it was the early time. But then it became a pretty 
pretty quickly, let's say, this international hub where a lot of expats came in, like looking for opportunities. Uh, the money came in, investors, right? And then mm. after the first successful exits, there was like this vibrant scene coming up. Um, and also, I, I believe back then this this term like Silicon Alley was coined, where like yeah. Berlin is, is basically became the, the 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 main the main hub in Germany when it comes to also digital innovation or software uh, industry, uh, among other cities. But I think Berlin was really on, really on the rise back then. Yeah, mm. I've even noticed it in the few years that I've been focusing on Berlin is that it's it's been a huge growth since even like 2016 2017 um who knows what the next decade will be but yeah since 2006 it must be absolutely unrecognizable yeah and i mean B berlin also has changed in terms of back then it was really much more affordable in terms of like like living in terms of like being there right nowadays it becomes a bit more like like london or paris like the 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 rent is starting to rise and the the cost of living is just a bit a bit higher than usual uh, but i think this is this is the the thing that comes with the with the rise as well yeah absolutely same in london you know flat viewings of 30 people and yeah a real a real competition for stuff why did you do um not pure computer science in your studies and did that do you think that hindered you at all or helped you doing digital media no, I mean, for, for me, it was a conscious decision, right? Because I always wanted to have a bit of this creative touch in my work, right? So for me, like traditional computer science, also, uh, I was I was studying at the University of Applied Science or at a traditional university, because for me, always the connection between like what I, what I learn in university and applying this to real problems and working in the industry was super important. I didn't want to do like a scientific career in terms of like research or purely, let's say, university studies so i wanted to always have this this applied part inside of that uh, also combined with like a little bit of creativity um like making stuff happen in a way and therefore like mm. the whole like audio video internet uh, component was a pretty pretty important one um and yeah i think this helped me a lot in, in not only seeing the theoretical part but also applying a bit of this broader picture to what i'm doing yeah well, I think the common thing, I mean, obviously, I have no idea, but because I studied history at university and then politics, um, but computer science, preparing software engineers for the world of work, apparently there isn't too much crossover once you, obviously, there's the fundamentals. Um, but do you think the, the university system and the computer science backgrounds and the degree is fit for purpose when it comes to, obviously, when you moved into your career in software engineering? Did you think that you were up to speed or would you have preferred to study different things on the computer science side at uni? Yeah, I mean, it's a good a good question. So I always like worked besides like doing my, my studies. I always had like jobs in the industry, right? As like a part-time student job or stuff like this to really make sure that like what I'm doing has some, some real life uh, uh, context as well. But I believe like coming from university... I mean, the, the industry is is different from what you learn at university for sure, right? And and nowadays you always also see like these like quick programs, how to get like a, a programming uh, education in a, in a few uh, weeks or a year or whatever. So I think like a good theoretical background is super helpful and important, right? From from this angle, I really say that the, the education in university helps a lot to be successful, but also there are so many things that you don't le learn in university. For example, the whole aspect of working working in a team together, mm -hmm. right? The whole aspect of communication, the whole aspect of maybe uh, how to, to work in agile environments, how to, to deal with stakeholders, how to have a, a context, like also with, with business and business questions, right? So for me, it was always only touched on the surface but when I moved into like the industry, it became really obvious that this is like a huge part of the job as well. Not only being mm. a good coder, but also being a good communicator, being a good connector, being a good like also uh, counterpart to product and design and all the other yeah. other functions you are finding in the, in the modern day uh, company, right? Yeah, hundred percent. When I first started doing you know software engineer recruiting, I almost thought that it was basically like a ranking of just how good you are at coding. You know, whether you're like a coding wizard. Um, and I just thought, obviously, I come to it from the point of interview processes. And I just thought all companies had a rank of just how hard they are to get into based on how good you need to be at coding. Um, and obviously, that absolutely is, is not the case, because I'd have one software engineer pass another process and fail another and then another you know, do the opposite. And soft skills is absolutely huge. And I think more and more, I don't know. Um but yeah. that's so underrated when in, in the software engineering space. No, I 100% agree. And, and also maybe this, 
I, I want to say like this cult of like having these pro uh, coders like maybe came even like from from the US from the, the Silicon mm -hmm. Valley where they really had like companies like Google or Facebook or, or Apple really like have super super strict interview processes where they have like uh, very difficult questions and stuff coding right uh, but then like the all the other aspects you just mentioned I, I'm We're maybe like not rated that important, but I believe like they they are super important, right? Especially like working working now in in a in a startup or in a in a company doing software development. I think it's, it's crucial to also be on top of that. And and coding is an important part for sure. Being a software engineer, obviously, but also it it can be also learned to a certain degree. And I also wouldn't be that strict to say like, okay, you you don't know that particular programming language therefore you're out of the process because you just don't know whatever kotlin uh i think this 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 doesn't make sense nowadays to really be that strict in terms of like having this this really hard checkpoints to say like okay this needs to be done or, or, or this number of years mm. in the industry whatever so i believe being a bit more flexible uh, makes a lot of sense because oftentimes you find like great people who don't like fit like this cookie cutter thing and you say like they don't fit maybe the the predefined requirements but they are still really really good for the job because they bring in maybe a little bit more diversity a mm. uh, different experience right that can then ultimately help you to do a, a better better team building or whatever you want to do there absolutely Now, obviously, what you're doing now, you, you director of engineering, um, is a world away from when you started your software engineer career. Now, we obviously don't have to go through things bit by bit. Um, but one thing I do like to ask engineering leaders, because there's plenty of software engineers out there, even you could translate it to other domains as well, where they just want to be a technician and be on the tools for their whole career. And that's what makes them happy. That's what they like. Um, and that's absolutely fine. And there's, uh, you can have an amazing career doing that. Now, you obviously didn't do that. You've pursued leadership route, management route, and now I'm guessing you're managing multiple, multiple teams. So yeah. at what point did the leadership side come into it? Or, or where did you think to yourself, I'm going to go down the management route? Yeah, yeah, good question. So maybe just briefly touching like one aspect you just mentioned, maybe we can come to this a bit later. I, mm. I believe in general, like the the whole individual contributor track in many companies is a lot underdeveloped. So at some point, a lot of engineers feel a bit of the pressure to to get into the management track, to become like successful and to get like to the next stage of the career ladder. So I, I believe, as you say, like it's totally valid to stay in the code and to stay in the architecture and to stay like in the individual part for a longer time. And I think this is something that companies need to, to also value uh, in an equal way how you go into the management track, right? Um, having said this, so I chose like the management track or basically I was I was stumbling a little bit into this. So it was at my, basically already at my first job at, at Studiford set back then when I joined. I believe it was like three years after I joined, so pretty early in my career already. Uh, and it was like the typical story, right? So we had like uh, massive growth in terms of like getting new people in. There were no leaders. And then you somehow took over a, a leadership role without like officializing this. And then suddenly mm -hmm. you spend less and less time on the code and more and more time into like building up the team, uh, creating a roadmap, working with product. Uh, aligning this with other teams, right? So you, I slowly faded out basically the the coding part and increased my my management part, uh, and then at some point uh, I became like a team leader and then eventually like a head of uh, engineering. So it it basically uh, developed in a way where I didn't even consciously decided to become mm. a leader, but it was like just a necessity based on the environment. And then I saw, hey, this is actually what I want to do, and this is what I like even more than than coding. But looking back maybe at this time, I mean, if I could decide again, I, I maybe would have stayed in coding for a little bit longer, right? Because I had the feeling that I was going pretty quickly to the management track and and, and like I didn't spend too many years on, on hands-on coding, to be honest. Uh, mm. um, but this is something that I also uh, like, that I also do in my spare time, but only like uh, in, a, in, a, in a fraction of the time that of obviously that a yeah. regular software engineer would do. Do you think that's because, and maybe cue the messages, angry messages from software engineers, is that obviously you come across, you know, you speak very well, communicate very well, charismatic person, and maybe software engineering doesn't lend itself all the time to that personality. So when someone's coming in and is perhaps a better communicator, you're almost earmarked to go into a leadership role, <laughs> whether you like it or not. Yeah, I I believe this is this is definitely true to a certain degree. Uh, and as I said earlier, like 
communication is sometimes a weak spot of, of software engineers or they, they are not willing to invest a lot of time uh, into that. Mm. Or also what I oftentimes see is that, that software engineers tend to communicate pretty technically to all kinds of audiences and then they are, they are losing uh, maybe uh, business folks or, or product people because they are, they are going into technical details so quickly uh, and, and, and then the message gets lost along the way, right? And yeah. therefore, I believe like being, I mean, as a leader, you're also a bit of a translator between like the tech teams and the, the rest of the organization, right? Making sure that information is flowing in, in, the, in the right way. Um, and this is always something that I enjoy to really like to tailor the message to also like to, to hand over the, the most important information, but also not let the team drown in unnecessary details that come from the outside or maybe even like some project ideas that will maybe never even see the, the light of day, right? To really make sure mm. that they know what they need to know, but also that they are not getting all the noise or all the, the, the buzz from, from the rest of the company, but staying focused on what they should deliver and not let them uh, pivot or be confused like all the time. Mm. So I think this is one of the the, the, the most essential tasks as a, as a leader. And, and actually, I, I kind of enjoyed that uh, pretty early on. Mm. It's almost like one thing I can probably relate to is, you know, when you first started in software engineering or when I first started in recruiting is you had one task to do, you had to deliver. It was hard, but you had to deliver and, and you could do it. And that's all you had to really think about. And then obviously, as you move up in your career and there's fires you need to put out, there's teams you need to communicate with. And the amount of people I speak to who almost miss those days where they could just get stuck in on something and just go with it and not have to worry about anything else. It's amazing how many engineering leaders I speak to who miss the good old days where they could just sort of do some coding for the day and then and then go home. Absolutely. I mean, this is also when, when we are touching the, the fact of like being promoted and climbing up the career ladder. I mean, some people are doing it because they believe they, they need to do it to like get more money or get mm. more exposure or because the colleagues are getting promoted and you don't want to want to stand back uh, beside behind them right so you you're also going for that promotion but also more and more the more you progress in your career you're also leaving as you say like this protected team space and the, the way of like you having a clear agenda and you have like some tasks to work on and mm. you have like defined colleagues and you have this sense of accomplishment at the end of the day to say like oh I finally whatever got this this external api integrated and it works right so and this is the accomplishment and when you become a leader like these accomplishments getting less clear and less obvious so it's much more difficult to really pinpoint about like what's exactly the value you bring to the organization and you need to draw a lot more from from yourself because you usually don't have like the the, the team anymore where you have like peers but you are suddenly the, the leader of the team and then you are not like in, in a sense not equal anymore because you're somehow a bit like leading the team and not like being being a, in the peer group more or less and mm -hmm. this can be really for some some especially like engineers who then like do the step for being a first-time leader can be a bit alienating to say like now i'm a bit outside of the team i don't, I don't code anymore uh, i feel like i'm spending like days and days in meetings and alignments and whatever uh and and what's actually the the, the tangible outcome at the end of the day mm. you can't yeah it, it's you can't measure and you know we all like to have control over what we do and yeah, when you're coding for even I said, and we draw the comparison again to recruitment, when you're working on, on roles or trying to pick up clients, you can measure it. But when you're doing all the bits outside it and, you know, lining up all the dots, it yeah, it's more, more frustrating. Yeah, it's more this enabling part, right? And it's always, you always, you don't know how would it be without you, right? So it's always, you don't have like the the the, the baseline to say like, what's the extra value that you can provide mm. as a leader to to make things better, to to get the team more productive, uh, stuff like this. And and it's, it's always hard to really to to pinpoint what's the, the extra value you are mm. bringing. Uh, but of course, like talking to other leaders in the early days when you become one totally helps. And also there are certain, certain metrics you can use also for the teams to measure productivity and yeah. to also get feedback from them, right? And to get get also the right level of, of let's say, um, yeah, feedback in a sense to also know if you're doing a good job or not. Absolutely. When you were going into these lead roles and slowly moving up and up and up, were you ever worried about, because obviously you are going to not be as sharp on the tools, on the, on the coding side, um, did that, was that ever a concern for you that you could potentially, you know, lose the skills that had got you to where you are today? 
Yeah, I mean, pretty pretty early on, I, I realized that you cannot be that that fluent anymore in terms of like coding, in terms of hands on whatever working with databases or knowing the tools inside out or having tried out everything yourself. So this is soon enough not possible anymore, just because your day is so full with other things. So, uh, and and I mean, the, the the secret is also to not get stressed out by this, right? And to also rely on people in your team. Uh, mm. that are then more more fluent in these things and more knowledgeable, right? And to also ask them about, like, can you give me a demo or can you give me a run-through about, like, the, the architecture or the system um, and, and, and trying to stay as close as possible without going too much into the details, right? So you should know still about, like, the architectural decisions or the the technology, the software being used, the pros and cons about it. But of course, you don't have like the, the in the trench knowledge to say like what are the quirks, what are the the, the specificities about like how to implement it and how to use it, right? So this this soon enough gets a bit blurred, and then at some point you you are knowing like the big themes and trends and maybe what uh, what new like software comes out or like what new libraries are now uh, in the in the game more or less, right? Mm. But you cannot try out everything yourself. You cannot really uh, test stuff out in in depth, but also like. For me, I'm I'm trying to keep up to to date with like reading blogs or going to conferences, or also talking to other people, and then you also see what are the bigger trends and what is like what are the main things that you want to spend time on to really go more into depth, without having the ambition to know like every every new thing inside out. Yeah. How long does it take for for you, you to kind of lose that that touch on on the tech side? And is there like a moment where you you're maybe with a current software engineer and you think? Oh, actually, yeah, it's it's been a while now. I am rusty. Yeah, I mean, this, as I said, pretty quickly, I I, I realized that this is not not really possible mm. anymore to to keep up to to speed uh, like, like this. If there was a moment, I mean, like suddenly, if you like hear about like new frameworks or new design patterns or stuff, and you say like, oh, I'm I'm actually not that that, or you only read the head uh, read the the headline and don't know like about the details, you realize that you are a bit like too much uh, in a, in a distance, and then you maybe go in a bit deeper. Um, but then also. What what I said to myself is if I have like the people in my team who are smarter and better in these things than I am, it's a good thing, right? So right. it's not the ambition for a leader to be the best technical person. If it would be like this, you would have made a mistake because you need to hire people who actually do the job and be the, the, the technical lead or the, the principal engineer or however you call it in your company to cover this role for you and be a sparring partner and, and staying close in touch and getting the information in. I think this is something that that's, that's crucial. Uh, and if you can ensure this, then, then all the rest will fall fall also mm. uh, in place. Yeah, it's almost like an ego thing, isn't it? Yeah, leave. it's a bit of, of course, like if you are a software engineer, you always always have the ambition to write good code and stuff, right? And then then you 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 see, like, of course, sometimes you're looking into the code and you say like, oh, actually, I'm, I'm not, not 100% sure anymore, like what's exactly going on in this piece of code. And then you realize, oh, I got really a bit rusty because like maybe there are some, some new things that you don't know exactly what they do. Uh, and of course, this feels at the beginning a bit strange and say like, okay, I'm losing a bit of my core competency being a coder or being a software engineer. And I mean, in, in, in heart, I'm still like an engineer and I want to build things and I want to understand how stuff works and I want to plug, plug things together that they work uh, fine, right? And um, I mean, for, for me, uh, it gives me a level of confidence to say like, if I would spend the time, I would also get up to speed quickly enough, right? But this is not what, what I need to do right now. And this is not what's asked for me as a value to bring to the organization. So therefore, I'm, I'm trying to limit this to really a few maybe spare time or pet projects that are not crucial or maybe like spending some some hack week into doing some stuff in the company, but not in any mm. critical path, right? Yeah, yeah. So you're the camp where, because I know especially, I mean, you go on, on social media re when Elon Musk took over Twitter and said that all engineering managers should code and then they're like managing 20 people. Um, and I know there was huge debate uh, around that. So you're sort of a, the, the camp where actually focus on other stuff and, and let the engineers take care of it. Yeah, actually I am. So so I, I believe like managing whatever 20 people or two, three teams and then at the same time doing doing coding and bug fixing and, and on call or whatever. I think in my world, this this doesn't fit 100% together, right? Because then you are maybe doing either side not really good, right? If you are coding at the same time as managing people having one-on-ones, I mean, per definition, like you don't get this uninterrupted time to do high quality code, right? You are you are maybe sometimes unavailable for critical things, right? So just from the time perspective, it seems to be pretty hard uh, to do that. And, and also, I'm not really uh, the biggest fan of, of some 
like schools of, of Silicon Valley, where they say like mm -hmm. engineers everywhere and basically all product folks should be engineers and uh, like, everybody should be engineer in a critical position because if you are a tech focused company, then everybody should be an engineer. I think this is also uh, not, not the, the perfect path, right? Because every, everybody has like a certain skill set. And, and if you're doubling down into doing this, what you're doing really right and good, uh, I, I believe this is more valuable than, than being a coder and a leader at the same, same time. Mm, interesting yeah i know that popped off when when all that twitter stuff was going on anyway um one thing i do ask the engineering leaders i, I get on this podcast of which there have been quite a few now there's plenty of engineers who tune into this that are looking to make that step in their career maybe thinking about leadership maybe are looking for a promotion into that role because usually that's the way to to get that experience to then kind of go to another company. Yeah. Um, so what advice would you give to maybe a, a software engineer that's an, exp an aspiring engineering lead? Yeah. So my first advice I would give is that you should be like self-aware about what's the reason that you're going to pursue this step, right? What's the background that you really want to do it? Is it like just as I said before, is it like the money, the prestige? Is it like, like I need to do it because I want to step up the career ladder and want to get more exposure? Or what's the real reason you're doing it? Because all the ones I've mentioned are not really good reasons. You should do it because you want to really to, to take this, this extra step. You want to get like this extra responsibility. Uh, you, you want to help the company you're working in to be more successful. And not because of like some strategic career decisions and say like, oh, if I'm now getting the promotion in this company, I'm having a better better position if I move to to a different one. So I think this is this is not not the best best reason why to get promoted. So you should really talk to people who have the role, really see what, what is it all about. Are you ready for this? Because also I've seen that like some people are are really getting a bit prematurely into this. I want to get like now the next the next job grade and whatnot. And and sometimes a bit of rushing through the ranks, right? And saying, okay, mm -hmm. now I'm I'm a junior, I'm a mid-level, I'm a senior, I'm a tech lead, I'm a principal, or I'm becoming uh, whatever, a team leader, something like this. So it's a bit of like people, uh, once they got promoted to a new level, they're already looking for the next one and say, what's the next step? What's the next level, right? Which is like to a certain degree understandable. But also I believe like spending some reasonable time in, in the position you are in and learning about it and deepening your knowledge and then consciously deciding now I feel ready for the next step. I think this is... This is my first advice I would give mm. to really to not rush it and to to really think about it and to also explore the the reasons why you are doing it and and make this a con a conscious decision and not being pushed by maybe your own manager or by the outside or or maybe by some CV aspects or I don't know what. Um, this is really important, I believe. Mm. Do you think that has also been fueled by? In maybe in recent years, the demand for software engineers has been so high that there's almost been like job title inflation. And people know now that if they get a certain level on their CV, someone somewhere is going to add a premium onto their onto their salary if, if they were to move. And it's almost fed into that culture of wanting that next step because those salary raises have been you know fairly easy to come by. Yeah, I think this is definitely one of the reasons. And and you have, as, as somebody being in the recruiting space, you have seen like the, the last years were pretty crazy in terms mm. of like companies spending tons of money, handing out like fancy titles to to people because they just like the market was was so difficult and, and partly so empty. So then having a like basically all engineers, they, they move to a different company and, and only if they got like a better title and more responsibility and whatnot. And as I said, even sometimes maybe not being ready for this step or not even having this done in the old company and then suddenly being mm. responsible for, for uh, dozens of people uh, having led maybe a small team before, right? So this is also then bad for the company where the people come in because there is just like a, a lack of, 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 let's say, knowledge about that. And also, I see oftentimes that in, in many companies, there's also not really an education system for leaders, right? So oftentimes, mm -hmm. there is a good curriculum for, for engineers learning about like certain software and tools and whatnot. But like there is very little training provided for upcoming leaders or for leaders who are going up the ladder and need to learn more things, right? And, and therefore, yes, I believe there was a certain certain inflation on this and, and also looking at the current market which like cooled down a lot obviously also with like lots of layoffs in in many companies this is also 
currently like bringing stuff a bit more on a on a on a on a more normal level now and and also maybe we see a bit of a change of dynamic now right but i also believe that in the last years there's been a bit of a, a rush and a, and, a, and a cult for for going for this title going for this next step uh, and using basically a, a job change to to also increase your your title yeah yeah there's certainly and i know in months sort of senior engineers it's not really cooled down too much because you know they're always in demand but especially since the, the covid bounce back boom the amount of senior engineers that were promoted to lead because they couldn't find another lead. Like I've had so many instances of that. And then it just creates, if someone's not good at that side of things, there's this toxic culture and it can get really messy. And obviously it's, I'm a bit biased because I hear the people that only really hear the people that want to leave. So, um, but I've had plenty of instances of that. And I mean, one other aspect is that sometimes you're also doing the mistake, especially in smaller companies when you're promoting all your best engineers to leaders and then suddenly you are left with teams where the best engineers now are leaders and don't code anymore and then the team is maybe technically less good because you are losing all of these great engineers because yeah. you just promoted them to leaders sometimes it's the right step sometimes it's not right uh, but it's also a bit of a risk that you can can also then damage your your tech yeah. org by just promoting everybody to to a lead position and then having maybe only a few mid-level engineers being left in the teams, right? So this is also a decision you need to be conscious about that can happen to, to really then maybe having a less technical standard in the teams. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I wanted to get onto your role now. You are director of engineering. Yeah. And I know even with that role, that's uh, that's the title that can vary from, from company to company. Um, so just to paint a picture, I mean, what would you describe your your role as as now and you know how many engineers and teams are you currently in charge of yeah yeah so definitely director of engineering is something that's that's can be pretty non standard in terms of like it varies a lot uh, depending on the company you are you are asking so just to give you a few a few hard facts before before going into maybe some details so Uh, currently, my my department that I'm responsible for at N26 is called Digital Banking Experience. So it's basically everything that that our end customer can, can use and see and touch, right? It's the iOS mm -hmm. app, Android app, the web app, and all the corresponding backend services that are attached to that. Currently, it's a, a little bit over 200 people in this in this department, 30 teams. I'm having 10 direct reports, so it's a pretty reasonably sized uh, organization, right? And um, I mean, if if I should describe, let's say, my my day by day or my typical week, it's difficult. I would say so. There is no typical week in that sense. So I have some fixed cornerstones that I'm always like having in my calendar, like one on one meetings with my directs, uh, team meetings with the engineering management, also some geo fixes about important projects, um, uh, and also some obviously interviews and other things like that. But also there is a lot of time where I need to spend like for for ad hoc things, developments that come up that are like not foreseeable right so also uh, spending lots of time in, in asynchronous communication slack email to make sure stuff is is up and running also communicating a lot like with stakeholders other departments making sure that teams and segments are aligned among each other um, making sure priorities are properly communicated and set right so this is also one important part but like there is there is not a typical week or typical day that i could paint out Uh, mm. It's always a bit of a, a mixed bag of different things, right? Uh, personal communication, as I said, is always like a cornerstone I want to ensure and to want to make make room. But I also consciously leave a bit of room in my calendar to also respond to these ad hoc things where where I believe it is important to jump on directly before like the, the fire is starting to get so high that it gets like critical to really be on top of things early before before they escalate. Mm. How does that not become overwhelming? to be in charge of 200 people? I mean, like the, the, the first thing you need to ensure is that you have a good leadership team, right? So I have like a, a bunch of really great uh, heads of engineering. And then uh, below that, there is a, a group of really good engineering managers that are then directly responsible for the team. So you need to build a trusted team where you can really delegate things and be sure that it's done in the right way. Um, and also delegation in a way where you're not saying I'm delegating stuff that I don't want to do myself, but also like having the trust that they can do it in a good way and also empowering them to do the, the, the right things for their own areas, right? So really a good way of delegation is important. And also you need to to be pretty, pretty uh, consistent in terms of also saying, I can only do so many topics at the same time and then prioritizing if something new comes in to say like, can I do this additional to what I'm already doing? 
If not, is it more important than something else that I'm doing at the moment? And then also dropping mm -hmm. stuff that you may be already doing, right? To, to also, as I say, not overwhelm yourself and then deliver subpar work on certain aspects, but say, hey, I can, I also have like a work in progress limit as a person, right? I can only deal with so many things in parallel in a, in a good way. Um, and if then something comes up that's, that's suddenly important, then you need to also then pause or drop some, some other tasks or delegate mm. this to somebody else, right? I think yeah. this, is, this is important. Also, good time management is important to really be in charge of your calendar, to also sometimes say uh, you need to cancel meetings or not accept them because you don't have the time. Um, so these are all things you need to, to ensure to, to also stay in a, in a healthy state of mind for yourself. Absolutely. Uh, someone else I had on the podcast, uh, CTO of um, co-founder of Qubit9 in, in Hamburg. Um, the episode's not out yet, depending. Well, actually, no, you listen to this, it is out. Um, but at the end of every week, he um, he has like stop, start, resume. So everything is done that week. What does he need to stop? What does he need to start? Um, and what does he need to pick up again? And uh, it just keeps everything regimented and you know it stops just being overwhelmed with stuff and you know wasting your time as well yeah there's there's definitely a risk in, in in these kind of positions that you're getting overwhelmed with like too many things that are then piling up on your desk and oftentimes you have also these long long running things where you need to wait for certain decisions or certain developments to happen and then they are always in the back of your mind and, and occupying some some mental capacity that you cannot use for something else right and this is mm. as i say like it's super important to also then be aware that these things are existing and then also consciously say, do I want to still keep this on, on, on my desk or is it something that doesn't go, go further and you can drop it or you can maybe ask somebody else to, to support you with that. Um, so having this decision like often is for me also imp important to, to do that. I'm also like pretty traditional, also really using like paper and stickies to also make sure mm -hmm. that I'm have visibility on, on stuff. Uh, and then also really literally like dropping things from from the board and say, okay, I'm not doing this yeah. uh, at the moment. And also then I think the most important part is that some people like are dropping stuff but not communicating it, but also be open and say like, hey, listen, I'm currently not going to work on this, but not in a mean way, but say, I just cannot do it at the moment. And usually you are met like with a positive response because they say, oh, it's it's okay. We can do it later, right? Oftentimes mm -hmm. it's not that urgent. And, and making sure that others who may be relying on you that they know about like a certain delay or that you're not doing stuff. Um, this is for me also mm -hmm. core principle of being being open to your colleagues and and communicating if you are overwhelmed. And uh, 100 of the times this is this is received in a, in a, in a good way. Um, so yeah, would recommend this for sure. Perfect. And what does work life balance look like for a director of engineering at a massive fintech, a massive tech company? Yeah, also a good, a good question for sure. So work-life balance is, is something that's also really important to, to ensure and also being being in that position with so many people, there's always something coming up and there's always like uh, uh, a thing around the corner that requires your attention. Uh, so it's important to also get some really some time where you're, where you're logging off, where you ensure that others are doing the job when it comes to, for example, uh, incidents at night or whatever, make sure you have like a good on-call squad that covers the, the thing and it only uh, calls you when 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 your help is, is definitely required and urgently needed. Um, and then also like spend some time also outside of the work context. Um, I mean, this has been even more difficult nowadays in this remote work or home office times when you are basically yeah. like your office is 10, 10 meters away from your living room, right? You are, you are basically... Uh, constantly attached to also work topics and then it requires additional effort to say like really logging off literally and say i'm doing something else and i'm going out and maybe whatever you you like to do enjoying time in nature or doing some 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 things that have nothing to do with like uh, software engineering or internet companies or startups or whatever also what helps me a lot is surrounding myself with people who have nothing to do with like this industry who have like a different set of of perspective and problems and whatever yeah. to also to to also get a bit of i mean we are we are in this in this bubble where i said like we believe that our problems are the most important ones and they are uh, like exclusively to us right and this is they're getting it's easy to get locked into this to this uh, scene and environment ecosystem where you believe this is the only one that counts but i think there, there is much more than this and zooming out a little bit sometimes and also talking to others helps you to put your own problems and challenges into perspective and and, and also keeping a bit of the the distance that you also need to maybe look at yourself and your work mm. 
and your company in a, in a more detached way sometimes to not being dragged into like the next problem and the next emergency and the next daily business issue that you're having because you will always have these kind of things right but if you are only working on these then you are getting drowned uh, pretty quickly yeah. so zooming out and getting like something that that makes you detach uh, from from work super important and this can be different for different people right for some it's mm -hmm. like meditation for others is like going out for others is like like having a hobby that has nothing to do uh with with tech um so f find find your own own uh, grounding uh, pole that you can use for for getting out and also then then having this this healthy distance between what you do yeah. And, and yeah i think with um software engineering it often comes under a bit of criticism maybe not relevant for kind of your level but there used to be this thing of you know, if someone's got a GitHub and they're coding at the weekend, they're doing pet projects all the time, you know, that that's kind of really healthy and encouraged. Um, I think there's been a bit of a backlash from that now, but there was almost this expectation that if you're a software engineer, it has to be your life. You know, that's all you do. You have to be this goblin behind a computer. Um, and that's really impressive. Uh, I don't know if you've seen that change at all i think i have a little bit but definitely even when i first started recruiting that was something that was encouraged i believe this this change definitely and this this the thing of like like putting in the extra hours and like being basically a coder 24 7 and as you say like doing open source and pet projects and whatnot on on the evening and having an impressive github repository and being active on a blog or twitter or medium i don't know like like really like living a life of of a software engineer like like totally immersed into the scene but for me, like this is not even like a desired state, right? And oftentimes, when you are when you are seeing engineers who are pretty young in the career, they have like the energy and they want to really learn everything, and they are all over the place. And m maybe for a few years, this can be a lifestyle that's healthy for you, and you want to really go up to speed quickly. But I also believe this cannot be sustained for a longer period of time, right? Because it also mm -hmm. makes you a bit a bit one dimensional to a certain degree, right? Because you are, you're always like immersed in this one, one world and you are getting really, really focused on like the software development stuff. Maybe you might be the best coder ever, but, but then is this really like everything you want to do in life to really do only coding 24 seven and, and all time? I believe like you're also losing some stuff and, and ultimately, in my opinion, this is not a sustainable lifestyle for, for a longer period of time. And therefore, I wouldn't encourage this at all, right? And it, it doesn't mean that, like, of course, like sometimes when, when you're having a project and say, like, hey, I want to get this done and, and I want to work, like, the through the night to really get this deliverable shipped, like, it's all good, right? But, like, this shouldn't be, like, the norm, but more the exception, right? And, yeah. And, um, yeah, and and from from that angle, uh, I mean, like, these, these hardcore engineers, uh, I think this is not something that's that's wanted or, or required anymore also i mean i recently read an article for the the japanese work culture where also this like working like all the time and having 80 hours per week was the standard but they're also getting back from from this idea of saying my job is everything and they also want to have this more healthy work-life mm -hmm. balance for them right and i think this is seen in all kinds of, of industries including the software engineering and and i believe it's a good a good trend to not not run uh, after this this like uh, coding goblins as you said yeah absolutely i know the japanese working culture is infamous isn't it for their their work rate and their work ethic and it's also infamous for for the negative sides right so mm. there are a lot of negative aspects uh, included and and this is uh, not something that we want to want to see for sure absolutely not to be fair berlin's pretty good at that in terms of encouraging work-life balance and healthy relationship. If I look at London and also obviously the US as well, I think Berlin's overall compared to other places in the world has, has got it down pretty good. Yeah, I, be I believe as well. And also, I mean, like the the German uh, labor law is also pretty strong in that degree, right? So there are a yeah. lot of good rights that that also protect uh, uh, workers from, from, let's say, spending endless hours in the in the office. Um, so therefore, I believe it's, it's good. You know, yeah. yeah. It's where the German bureaucracy actually does some good <laughs> for a change. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Uh, cool. So we're obviously going to wrap up soon. I know you're very busy and I know Christmas is upon us, but you are now uh, very accomplished in your career and not everyone <laughs> becomes a director of engineering at such a, a great and established tech company. Um, 
but where will you go from here? What do you see that the rest of your career looking like someone who's already achieved so much? Yeah, I mean, it's also a good a good question. So currently I'm super happy with my position at N26, right? So I'm having like a uh, lot of interesting topics, a great team. So this is something that that I'm, it's always most important for me. It's not like the, the size of the organization or let's say the, the reputation of the, the company. It's about like having a great team, having having a company with like a, a mission that I believe in, something that I would invest my, my time into, right? And what you can see nowadays maybe taking a short detour to recruiting again uh, and this is something that you you also might know from from yourself like things like like money or title or or remote work or a nice office or all that stuff this became more or less a bit of a commodity right so now it's about like what can the company offer in terms of like doing something that's that resonates with your own values where you say like i'm doing something that that helps maybe society or or the greater good to become uh, like better in a in a certain way right so this is something that i'm always looking for to say like i want to work at a place that has like an impact that makes stuff better that's that's able to di disrupt an industry where i say like m modernizing the, the the life of people making it better to a certain degree um and i think this is this is always something i i look out for and f in n26 i found this definitely for the banking industry right and who knows at some point in time what what comes next but i'm not a person who is like looking for for a title or whatever i was also already like cto of a smaller company now i'm i'm director of of n26 with like much more responsibility and this is again the thing where like the title is not really representing yeah. the the amount of responsibility or the, the size of the team or or even like the the context you're working in so therefore um yeah i'm i'm pretty open with, with that so i'm i'm super confident in in where i'm currently at and i want to spend like some more more years trying to disrupt the the banking industry and in using technology actually to to make a difference in terms of like shaking up the industry that has been like so uh, old school since quite some time and i believe there is a lot of a lot of potential for doing stuff in a more modern way uh, in a way where we can use tech to to really make stuff easier for the customer to make it more accessible to also i don't know to a certain degree also democratizing finance for everybody that they can that everybody can can invest into uh, crypto or stock or or being in charge of their own finances so these are things that motivate me that we can really use like the the skills we have as engineers to 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 build stuff that's that's easy and usable and even like to a certain degree maybe fun to use and people enjoy uh interacting with their their financial life versus like being being doomed to go to to a local branch standing in line for for an hour yeah. and then meeting somebody who doesn't even understand what you want uh, uh clearly so i think this is this is like one motivational factor that i try to get from from all of my jobs so every time that i decided to go somewhere else i was thinking to myself is this new job giving me something that i didn't have before maybe it's a new aspect of entering a new industry that you didn't know before so i was a long time in the in the e-commerce uh, uh, sphere uh, then moving into fintech which was complete for me completely new uh, because i don't have like a traditional banking background and also I, i never worked at the fintech before but also this is like one of the things that that was appealing to me that like joining n26 and having such a exposed position with somebody who is not a traditional banker or not coming from banking tech this was like also uh, to a degree like an upfront trust to say like hey i can apply maybe the skills that i've gained in different industries and applying this into the fintech world in a positive way even without like this long uh, knowledge that, uh, that maybe some other companies would have required uh, mm. that also work in the same space absolutely fascinating and one thing i, I did want to ask before we wrap up and uh, everyone usually always gives quite a modest answer but you've obviously achieved so much in your career um, as I said you've risen the ranks you've been CTO of a smaller startup you're now director of engineering but why do you think you, you've done what you've done and achieved what you've achieved you know is it work ethic attitude um, taking your opportunities I always look for points of difference with my podcast guests and yeah, if you could put your finger on something, I know it's kind of a bit weird sometimes to maybe compliment yourself and praise yourself. But is there anything you could put your finger on? Oh, that's a, a pretty a pretty tough one. But I, mm. I I try to to give you some some answer for this. So I, I believe like one one thing that I always always 
kept since basically the early days where we started is like the sense of of curiosity right so the sense of like trying to understand why are things as they are and and trying to go go deeper on on some problems and then really applying the knowledge that i have to to solve it in a in a good way right so i think this is something that you should m maintain at all times like being curious and, and trying to to ask the why question maybe one more time than other people are asking to say, okay, I want to really understand why certain things are as they are. And also maybe then ask additionally, is it really a given thing that we need to do it like that? Right. To mm -hmm. also like to challenge the status quo and to also to, to not be so impressed about like what has been done before you and say, okay, of course we are all standing on the shoulder of giants, but then also say like, maybe they didn't do everything right. And, and also oftentimes what I've seen entering in different industries Like it's it's oftentimes not rocket science what what everything is doing everybody is doing right also before I entered like the 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 banking and the fintech I was saying oh my god like banking it must be like so much more complex than than other industries right but at the end of the day it's it's also something that you can learn and it, like if you are if you are curious enough and say like and and not being scared about like oh there are a lot of abbreviations you don't know there are a lot of like laws that i don't i didn't read yet right and but then you need to say okay i'm just starting where i am and work my way through it having the confidence that at some point i will understand that right mm -hmm. and i think this is this is something that you should you should always bring and say like hey uh, this is something i can understand i can work on and then you can also then bring everything that you have learned before to this new job, to this new gig, and then trying to apply it. And also maybe another thing is to to be, to, and this is a bit of also what I've learned early in my leadership career, to put your ego aside quickly and say, it doesn't matter if, if your idea is the best one, right? So this is not, not the point. It's about like having a team that brings up the best idea. It's not important if it comes from the intern or the senior engineer or yourself or some other person. Uh, it's about like doing doing the right thing for for the company for the team getting getting a good decision and and not be also not be afraid of failure right so building an uh, an environment where you are allowed to fail and also then implementing the right security nets uh, be, below the team that they can experiment and try out things and then then maybe at some point fail but then also recover from that i think it's also important to to also give them the the, the confidence to maybe go one step further than than other companies or other teams have done and then maybe at some point even achieve something that's that's extraordinary or like the deviates mm -hmm. from the standard right where you're where you're leaving let's say the beaten path and then you are you're meeting let's say the, the, the rough jungle uh, and then you don't find the path immediately but then ultimately if you have the right equipment you can get through and maybe find a better way than than others have done being open enough to really look at this always with a fresh pair of eyes and this is also for example when when new people are joining my my department or the area or the company and i'm speaking to them for the for the first time then after maybe uh, also a few a few weeks when they are in the job uh, software engineer or whoever it is i always ask them because they have a fresh pair of eyes and they are coming in and asking but like what are the things that 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 we're striking your attention and where you said like okay this is maybe something that's not going in the right way because you're oftentimes getting a bit of like blindfolded by the way how you did stuff and this is a bit of an inevitable thing but always trying to take a step back and ask others for things how to improve stuff this is super important to, to not mm -hmm. settle and be complacent and say oh yeah it works like this and it's fine um i think you should should really be open for for improvements all the time Which doesn't mean that you need to shake up everything like every day or whatever and, and, and like uh, throw stuff away that works fine. Um, but also like just like look for this next improvement, see how you can can do stuff maybe a little bit better. And this is already enough for the next iteration. A bit of like agile software development, not trying to reinvent the wheel in one go, but like go in iterations uh, with like processes, how you do things with organizational uh, aspects, right? Um, and, and asking early and often about feedback and and also feedback not only from your maybe direct peers or your team members or whatever but also maybe feedback from the outside because yeah. oftentimes you you will see that that maybe non-technical uh, colleagues they have a pretty good view about like what is what is right or wrong in the tech department based on their 
external view, right? Because oftentimes, like the, the tech area is a bit of like this special area in a company, and they're always a bit like they always get a little bit more than others, and they're always a bit like whatever have these special uh, arrangements, and they can work from home all the time, whatever. So there's always a bit of this special area, uh, uh, and and also including others and asking them for for feedback. This helps a lot also to not only get like some good stuff that you can work on, but also to gain credibility and to also lower a bit like this 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 border between like maybe the tech department and other parts of the company and also to demystify a little bit like what's going on yeah. there because at the end of the day uh, uh, like an engineer is contributing to the company value maybe in a different way than a salesperson or recruiting person does but but also in in an equal meaningful way right and i think this this is something that you should always keep in mind that that you shouldn't take like your your own job as an engineer or a software leader or whatever like too too serious in terms of yes it might be a tech company and the technical uh, aspect might be a competitive advantage but also the other parts of the company they are super important as well and not losing the connection and the track between between you and these other areas is super important yeah. absolutely absolutely well what a way to finish uh thank you so much Velka, for coming on in your time and i think we covered so so much and i know that you know there'll be people listening in that will really benefit from your words so thank you <laughs>